That's all it takes. There's four main components, the brass, the primer, the powder, and the projectile. This week on Kentucky Field. This is a case trimmer, and I'm going to turn the mandrel until it doesn't go anymore. We're talking with an expert and learning how to save money and shoot more accurately, all at the same time. Then, when you're catfishing, you want to you want to use what bait they eat. We're on the mighty Ohio River targeting trophy catfish. It's a feeding frenzy today. It's all next on Kentucky Field. Oh my goodness. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plum floated with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> first Leo! Here it goes! Boom! Oh, oh. Oh. Wow, that happened fast. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. If you like shooting firearms and you're having trouble finding ammunition, you may have another option. We're here today at Nicholasville Reloading Supplies and Guns, and I'm here to learn about something I've wanted to know about for a long time, and that's reloading. I'm here with Randy Bickley, and Randy, you've been reloading for a long, long time. Yes, sir. Here at the store, we get customers on a daily basis that come in. What are the basic fundamentals to reloading? What's the bare minimum amount of equipment that I would need? How expensive is it to get into? Tell me a couple reasons why someone would want to get into reloading. Cost is probably what most people think of first and foremost. You take an oddball caliber, like we're gonna to demonstrate today, a 325 Winchester Short Magnum. It's relatively new cartridge, 15, 18 years old, but it's extremely hard to find the mm -hmm. ammunition. One box of 20 rounds is typically around $80, $85 after tax. If you have to mail order it, then you have freight in included in that. So you can easily get up in the $100 per 20 rounds. Not only cost, you have a lot of people that are trying to squeeze as much accuracy out of the gun as they possibly can. Custom reloading saves money, but actually can increase your gun's accuracy as much as 60% in mm -hmm. cases. Another reason is out of date or antiquated. A lot of calibers out there, you physically can't buy components for. You have to hard cast your own lead. You have to research different powder charges. And another reason is personal satisfaction or gratification to know that you physically built that load. Think of it like a shotgun. Our grandfathers had one break open shotgun. Mm -hmm. That was their meat provider. They hunted 90% of their game with that one shotgun. Mm -hmm but they change projectiles, they change shot loads, mm -hmm. they change shot length, shot sizes, different grains of powder. They often reloaded. I see you've got a couple of components here to help build a rifle round. Tell me all the individual pieces of a manufactured factory round. So what you've picked up is a factory Winchester Super X round. As you can see right here, these are loaded charges that have never been fired. These are the once fired cases that came from those, the byproduct that we want to salvage. The case is approximately 45 to 50% of reloading cost. Mm. So if you have the case, in this case for a gun that's rare, you're saving 45 to 50% of the cost right off the bat. Wow. This brass has been washed. It has not been processed. We're going to actually do that step today. This is actually finished loaded ammunition that's from the same brass that that was. So we're taking this bullet, we're firing it, creating this brass. We're going to inspect and wash this brass. We're going to clean it. We're going to resize and deprime it. Then we will trim it. We will chamfer and bevel, remove the burr from the flash hider. We'll use a particular powder charge and type and weight with a particular projectile 
We'll come back to this machine and actually seat the bullet in and we'll measure it to make sure it's the correct overall length. That's all it takes. There's four main components, the brass, the primer, the powder, and the projectile. Now this is a very quick overview of reloading. By no means, by watching this segment, are you going to be proficient at reloading. There's a lot of information. You've read a lot of manuals. You've done this for many, many years. This is kind of just a basic overview of what reloading is, right? This is as quick and down and dirty as I can be in a very short <laughs> period of time. Yeah. So if you think that's something you may want to get into, the first step would be when you're out shooting, pick save your, your brass. Save your brass. You said this is 40% of your cost? It can be. With pistols, not so much so, but rifles it is. We're going to do this demonstration today with one particular rifle caliber only. So we're going to refer to our reloading manual. The reloading manual is going to show you all the processes of what happens when the bullet ignites. We'll talk about equipment. You have to have a set of dies. There are no fewer than six different manufacturers of dies. There are differences in price and there are differences in quality. This set of dies is a brand new set of dies. There is a collet mm -hmm. shell holder that has to go in each individual round and the label on the box physically will tell you it's a full length die set for the 325 WSM and it uses a shell holder number 43. Mm -hmm. This is a shell holder 43 and this is the actual sizing die. Okay. You can buy used equipment online, average normally $100 to $150 for a press. Mm -hmm. You have presses that are called turret presses that have a top tool head holder, if you will, a turret. You can put multiple dies around that turret, put one shell in, and every time you pull the handle, you'll rotate the turret and then do the next step. Gotcha. Rotate the head and do the next step. So if, if you were going to load like multiple rounds, like you wanted to load a thousand, two thousand rounds, you might want to turn. Even if you want to do, as I've done, if you want to do 40 rounds, you're going to inspect your brass, mm -hmm. you're going to wash your brass, you're going to re-inspect the brass because the dirt and the powder fouling may very well be hiding a superficial crack that you mm -hmm. didn't see. You just mm -hmm. thought it was a dirt smudge. Mm -hmm. You're going to re-inspect it. You're going to inspect every step of the process. If you're reloading to be in a hurry, you need to find another hobby because this is not something you want to take lightly. Mm -hmm. This is something you really want to do safely and efficiently and you have to go buy the book. Okay. All right, at this time, we're going to get the table cleared off and we're going to get set up so that we can actually start doing some reloading. Now we're set up to actually reload. And this is reloading once the brass has already been cleaned. Mm -hmm. We've already inspected these 10 rounds. Anytime you use a sizing die, whether it be to D prime or size, you have to use lubricant or you will wind up getting your brass stuck in the die. So I've already placed these 10 rounds in my individual loading block at roughly a 45 degree angle. I'm gonna make two passes so that the overspray physically goes down in the chamber and as well as the top. We want the overspray pattern to capture as much as we can. It's going to creep around the brass. Okay. From there, we already have the press set and it is adjusted so we have zero lash in the take up of the handle. We're going to push down until it bottoms out, pull it back up. Now what that actually did, I deprimed it and now I fully resized it and as I come back up, I have to go back against the expander ball, which takes it back again. So now this brass, the primer has been removed. Mm -hmm. It's been fully resized. So now what we need to do is we have sized them. And we need to double check what our case length is. Right now our case length is 2.105. Our book tells us that our trim length is 2.090. So we're gonna trim that excess length back off. This is a case trimmer, and I'm going to turn the mandrel until it doesn't go anymore. 
Now there are serrations on this, just like a dial caliper, telling me how many thousandths I've got to adjust this. So now that we've trimmed it, we're at 2.090. Oh yeah. And as you see, the burr forming, that's mm -hmm. how much metal it's actually trimming. All right, so now we have these eight rounds. Now that we've done that, we need to chamfer and bell. All it's gonna take is just a couple of turns because you have three cutting faces. That particular edge trims the outside, which is the bevel. This put a chamfer on the inside. The inside chamfer helps the bullet feed into the brass without distorting or scratching, removing material from the diameter of the projectile itself. The next step that I'm going to do, we're gonna deburr the inside of the flash hole. The flash hole is the hole in the very center of that primer pocket area. You want that burr removed. Now, that's how much material I just removed that was sticking inside that hole. Sometimes you have to put a glove on to help hold the brass. All right, so now that we've finished all of that, this is actually a beveler. I want to put a rounded edge to help funnel that primer in there, and that's what that does. Not all brass is going to require this step. Your case inspection will determine whether that needs to be done or not. So from here, we've finished the case preparation. We are technically now ready to come back to the reloading press and the powder measure and powder scales, and now we're ready to load these final rounds. All right. So now we're set up back over here at the actual reloading press. So we've inserted our primers in the primer tube. They're ready. We've removed our sizing die. We'll insert one case in the case feeder. We're going to actually pull back on the primer lever, which loaded a primer in the cup, lower the handle, push the cup forward, and push forward. With that, you can see the new primer is actually just a little bit below flush. It's pushed down in. You can see the radius edge that we trimmed. Yeah, that looks great. And I never touched a primer. You don't want the oils from your skin to contact the powder or the primer. I actually put my powder in and I adjust the screw up or down to insert the amount of powder that I need. We're loading 65 grains. I want my tenth to be on zero. In this case, it needs possibly one kernel. It is dead even on zero. That is exactly 65 grains. I'm going to hold the powder foam, and I'm gonna slowly pour that in, tap it for just a second, make sure it all fell down, and repeat the process. Okay. Now that I've dumped the powder in, I'm gonna take a flashlight, and I'm just gonna secondary check. Again, you can't check too often. I wanna look inside each one to measure to make sure there's powder in there. I don't wanna take the chance of missing one. So these are the projectiles that we're using. These are Barnes TSXs, and they're actually going to seat that far down inside mm. the brass because we're loading it to the SAMI overall length recommended. We're not loading specifically to your gun, but as you can see where the powder line would be, that bullet is sticking down into that powder. Yeah. So that powder is actually going to come on up into wow. the case neck. So now we're ready to actually seat the projectile. We're going to insert it into the case mouth, hold it centered till it enters into the machine, and we're just going to fully close the press and bring our handle back up. Now I've already taken the advantage of setting this assembly so that it's the right length. Our calipers are right now set on a true zero. We are not crimping at all, and our case length is 2.860 on the money. You are completely loaded, my friend. Well, what I absolutely love about this process, one, it was a lot of fun, it's very educational, and now I have a premium round that you've taught me how to duplicate when I need more. It was a very quick and brief session, and look forward to helping you further you along as you continue to do this in the future. Thank you so much. Fall is the time of year that many Kentuckians hit the woods to go hunting. But don't forget about the fishing. You may want to consider the big rivers.
The last two or three weeks have been fishing has been really good down here. We can catch a lot of numbers and a lot of good quality fish. A lot of fish in the mid 20 pound range or uh, low 30s. We're in between fronts right now and uh, the, the water flow is good today and we got a big cold front coming in uh, tomorrow afternoon so fishing ought to be pretty pretty okay. good today I would think. We're spot locked here. Got pretty good current. I think we uh, get some bait cut up and get after it here. Skipjack herring, Asian carp. Yeah, all that was caught out of the Ohio River. When you're catfishing, you want to fish for, you want to use what bait they eat. The way I hook these skipjack heads, just come up, uh, come up there like that, and run it out the nose. And these uh, cut baits like this, because if you throw them out there, and the guts is the best part there, it's just for scent. And I'll just wrap around that hook there, come up through the top here, like that. We got a two ounce sinker, and then we, we got, you know, maybe about a, that's probably about, a, you know, 25, 30 inch, maybe a liter at the most. Okay. Usually I want my hook, my hook dropper pretty close to the bottom of that. We got a little swivel up here, they call them these rolling T swivels. Okay. The boat's anchored right now, and you just slowly, you just slowly drop this down. Key to this bumping deal is having multiple size sinkers. Because if you don't have multiple size sinkers, you can't get it right. You don't want this bait zipping back here too fast, and you don't want it just sitting there either. So I'm not quite on bottom yet. There I hit bottom there. And then the trick of this is once you're filming, you it just film that sinker is just barely feeling like a flick down there. It's just real soft. And then as I'm doing that, I'm just I got my thumb bar engaged, and I'm just Feeling that bottom, and as that current's taking, pushing that bait back, I'm just letting it, letting it go back. I'm just slipping a little bit of line out of my thumb there, and, and, and we'll just keep walking it back. I tell people when they first learn this, you can't get this bait far enough back from the boat. Gotcha. But with that being said, you have to be able to feel that sinker hit bottom. Mm. If you're not feeling that sinker hit bottom, then you're just, you're not in that strike zone. You gotta be in that strike zone, and it just takes time and practice on being able to do it. Right there's one right there. Let's see. There he is. <laughs> you, already right got a, you already got a fish hooked up just giving us a demonstration. Right Let me get the net here. Good start of go. fish, probably about a eight, nine pounder there. Look how fat that fish is. You think they're, think they're feeding up for the fall? <laughs> it's a beautiful day, sun coming up right now. We're just, just we're getting just started. Get, get, just getting started. Let's see what he weighs here. This is for, I ain't low heavier than I thought, but right at 10 pounds. 10 pounds. 10 pound fish. There you go. Beautiful fish. Nice fish. We'll let him go. There he is. You got him you're, now. You're fine. You sure? Yeah, you're Come fine. On. I got a bite right now, too. Doubled up. Got a double. Oh, he just come up. No, he's swimming right toward us. Got a double. Haven't been here 20 minutes. Swimming right toward me. Switch sides with you. Now, now who gets the net? <laughs> <laughs> Whoever's this fish is bigger. <laughs> Man, they're such strong fish. Oh. I ain't used to reeling fishing either, so. <laughs> Man, you were way back there. <laughs> oh, this is a nice fish here. This. Oh yeah. Probably 16, 17 pounder here. I think I got about the same size fish. Same size? Here, let me help you out. Ben, if you want this net, I got I... it. You got it? We'll just lip them like they do the bass fishing here. <laughs> look at the belly on that thing. You think these fish are feeding up? Good Lord, look at that. I mean, look at that belly. That is some uh, Ohio River catfish at <laughs> its finest right there. That is amazing. And I tell you what, it's so strong. I mean, we just literally, we just caught 40 pound of catfish. Yeah, just in. 45 pound of catfish. It'd be, be a good start for a tournament. Yeah, it sure would. <laughs> <laughs> Release these jokers and let them, let them grow, especially the ones Chad's got. He's gone. Look at that. Big old fat joker. Healthy fish. Probably 12 pounds. Yeah, right at it. Yeah, 
If this is something you really wanted to give it a, a try, before you buy, you know, just all the gear, hire a guide to come out here and, yeah. and learn it. Yeah. Because uh, you might end up buying a bunch of stuff that you realize that's not exactly what you needed in the first place. We're catching 25 pounders wondering where the big ones are at. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, that's spoiled is what that is. <laughs> you know something, Chad, Chad's getting into this. When we first started, he was willing to net my fish. Now he hadn't even brought it up yet. <laughs> oh, yeah. You see it? No, no, another 20. Oh, yeah, you got a nice fish here. Oh, yeah. I got a nice he's, fish. He's, he's, Man. Up, he's mid 20s. Look how yeah. long that fish is. That is a long fish right there. We're going to break 30 pounds. We keep messing around here. He's uh, 20, 22. 22. That's a good fish, man. What a beautiful fish. We can go tell all his friends it was well worth it. Go ahead and eat you some of that. Yeah. All right, we're going to move in some faster current here. And then uh, we're actually going to drift back as, as we're walking these baits behind us. We're going hunting for the big fish. We're going after some bigger blues. Oh, you got more in a bite. You're hooked up. Oh, look at this. Another double. <laughs> it's stripping some line Is here. It? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead and get some reels on him if you can. Yeah, get that rod up. I got mine about here in the boat. So I'll pull that hook out, let him wear himself down a little bit. There's mine. We'll chuck him back. There he is. Oh, yeah. Oh, this could be a big fish of the day right there. Got him. That's, there you that's go. our 30 pounder. <laughs> It'd be nice to get at least a 30 on film. Moved over here first spot. <laughs> I mean, doubled. Like, doubled on our very first cast. It ain't always like this, you know. <laughs> I mean, it, it's good fishing, but this, this is right now is. Back, back, we're fishing. Yep. Look at that. That fish is going to hit 30, yeah. isn't he? That's a nice fish here. This is, that is a nice fish. Oh, God, he's gonna beat me. He's, uh, about 37. 37 there you pounds. Go. I, th I think that might be the biggest catfish I've ever caught. I'm not sure. I've caught one or two close to that size. Yeah. He's, al he's almost pushing 38. Wow, what a fish. What a fish. That is why we get up at 4 o'clock in the morning right there. <laughs> It takes that big sucker right there. They don't get, it just doesn't, it never gets old. Been doing this a long time. There he is. It's a feeding frenzy today. You have to experience this to get an understanding for how strong these fish are. This is him. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, I'd say that's a good one. There we go. <laughs> Oh, Lord. Upper 40s. <laughs> Big ol'. Wow. What a fish. Bumping on the Ohio River. There you go. What a fish. He's 43. 43 pounds. Just a beautiful, beautiful fish. This is why you release them right here. The opportunities are out here. You're willing to put the time on the water. Or hire a guy that has put their time on the water. Yeah, we're pushing 200 pounds on our best five fish today. We're closing in. When the weather's right, catfishing is all about river conditions, river river level. And uh, you get you put fresh bait on there and you learn that technique and the opportunities are endless. So we're gonna get him back in the water here. We're very lucky here in Kentucky. We've got all these miles of the Ohio River and some Mississippi River. And all you gotta do is get out here and get below one of these dams, find you a deep hole of water, and yeah. give bumping a try. When you have a bite like this, there ain't anything like it. And uh, it really puts uh, catfishing on a map on what it can be and what it can produce. And that's why we do it. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Here we have eight-year-old Knox Weber who took his first deer using a crossbow. Nice job. Here we have nine-year-old Macy Rickard who caught this nice bluegill in her grandparents' farm pond in McLean County. Nice job. 
Here we have six-year-old Blake who got his first gobbler this year during the youth turkey season. Check out this beautiful largemouth bass that was caught by Kenneth Chisley. This was his first big bass that he caught out of Scott County. Nice job. Rabbit season, one of my favorite hunting seasons, comes in this week in the eastern zone here in Kentucky. Check your local hunting and fishing guide for more information. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.